Good morning, and I would like to welcome everyone to this, the first meeting of the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee in 2022. And can I wish everyone a happy new year? Our first agenda item is a discussion about taking the final item in private. The committee needs to decide whether to take item six, which is an item for the committee to consider its approach to an inquiry on future parliamentary procedures and practices in private. Are the members in agreement with this? I am grateful to the committee for that. Agenda item two is in relation to cross-party groups. And it is for this committee to consider applications for recognition from four cross-party groups today. And the first group we will consider today is a proposed CPG on beer and pubs. And I would like to welcome Craig Hoy, MSP, who is the proposed convener of the proposed group to the meeting. Good morning, Craig. I'd like to invite you now to make a short statement in relation to the proposed CPG. Good morning, uh, Mr. Whitfield, and uh, happy uh, new year to uh, you and uh, to the uh, <coughs> committee members. Uh, the cross-party uh, group on beer and pubs uh, held its first inaugural meeting uh, to prepare for this uh, meeting on uh, the 7th of December 2021. And that was in recognition of the fact that there are now over 4,600 pubs and 120 breweries in Scotland. The industry is uh, an emerging sector uh, and there is presently no uh, committee uh, or mm -hmm. cross-party group uh, looking uh, after its interests uh, within this uh, parliament. But we also know that as well as being an emerging sector, it is also a, a sector that is presently uh, at risk as a result uh, of the COVID pandemic and the uh, restrictions that were imposed upon the uh, hospitality um, sector. The purpose of the CPEG is to celebrate, to recognise and to enhance the contribution that the, uh, the brewing and pub related uh, hospitality industry plays in Scotland. And we hope that the CPG will operate through semi-regular meetings, occasional visits uh, and an annual event where the best of Scotland's beer and pub sector can be uh, showcased. The CPG will aim to develop constituency level awareness of the contribution of the beer and pub sector and will aim to develop an awards programme to encourage uh, recognition of local pubs and local breweries. And I, I do believe that is something that the convener is uh, aware of uh, uh, due to the fact that uh, uh, in his time as a Member of Parliament, he actually nominated uh, my local pub in East Lothian, the Tyneside Tavern, one of many excellent pubs in East Lothian and across the south of Scotland for uh, a local pub award. But the, uh, the CPG will also provide a forum to discuss the policies that will impact on the beer and pub sector and that will affect uh, uh, beer drinkers and pub growers across Scotland. And we will also obviously look uh, uh, closely uh, and with importance at uh, the issues of uh, responsible drinking, the social impact of alcohol um, and uh, the public health implications too. We understand that beer and pubs play a huge part in each and every region we represent socially uh, and economically, and they are job and wealth creators. And that will also be a core uh, focus of the group. Uh, with the committee's uh, permission, uh, I, I would be the convener of the group. Uh, Paul Sweeney would be uh, the vice convener. We have a wide range of uh, prospective members uh, from across all parties. And the secretariat would be provided by uh, and supported by the all party parliamentary beer group, uh, Canberra, the campaign for real ale, uh, SEBA, the Society of Independent Brewers, and uh, will also be supported by the Scottish Beer and Pub Association. And with that, I will hand back to you, uh, Mr. Whitfield. Thank, thank you very much for that presentation. Um, I, would, I, I was just going to point out before taking the matter further that um, I see in stark black and white my name as a member. Um, and as you may be aware, I have said that I, because of the role as convener, um, that I will not be joining or associating with any CPGs to provide um, a distance for this committee to operate. Um, so. With, with that slight unfortunate start, <laughs> if, that, if, if that could be rectified, I'd be grateful. But my question, um, and I am very supportive, um, obviously, of the um, pub trade and its importance across Scotland, is in relation to the Secretariat and the relationship between the CPG, which sits here in the Scottish Parliament, and the all-party parliamentary beer group, the APPG, which obviously sits in Westminster. 
Is it the case that the actual Secretariat support and work would be provided by both CAMERA and CBER rather than the actual APPG itself in Westminster? CAMERA and uh, CBER, but Paul Hegarty from the Old Party Parliamentary Beer Group uh, attended as a guest and will be supportive in helping us establish some of those programmes that have been very successful at Westminster, such as the awards programme mm -hmm. and also the uh, the possibility of getting a guest deal or a guest beer into the parliamentary estate here at, at Hollywood. Thank you very much for that clarification. I don't know whether any of the other committee members have any questions of Craig. Not seeing anything. So, um, can I thank you for attending this morning, Craig? The committee will consider whether to approve the application for recognition at agenda item three. The clerks will inform you of that committee's decision in due course. But can I thank you for coming along this morning? Thanks very much indeed for your time. Thank you. The next group that we're going to consider this morning is a proposed CPG on maritime and shipbuilding. And I would like to welcome Paul Sweeney, MSP, who is the proposed convener of the proposed group. Good morning, Paul, and Happy New Year. Um, would you like to give a short presentation to the committee about the intentions of the CPG? Good morning, convener, and uh, thanks for the invitation to address uh, your committee. Um, yeah, uh, the proposed um, establishment of a cross-party group uh, on maritime and shipbuilding is the first time this has been proposed in the history of the Scottish Parliament, but I think it is a very vital uh, exercise to be undertaking because Scotland has a longer uh, coastline than the People's Republic of China, over 6,000 miles. Uh, and for centuries, the maritime and shipbuilding sectors have been critical to the prosperity of the country. Um, and as we look towards the future, particularly with the climate emergency, the opportunity economically and socially that this sector provides for Scotland, presents to Scotland, is, is very significant indeed. So I thought it was very timely um, to consider the setup of this um, cross-party group and initially gauged opinion informally during the COP26 conference in Glasgow, um, where we were able to secure the support of six, uh, 15 colleagues, so 16 members in total, um, supporting uh, the creation of the cross-party group uh, and also secured the agreement of Maritime UK to provide the Secretariat. Um, so I'm very pleased at the level of cross-party support of the, the objectives and intent of the CPG um, to ensure we have a focal point in our national parliament, uh, to allow uh, industry, trade unions, and other stakeholders from across the country to come together and create a sounding board for the, the progress of the development of this industry in Scotland, so we can be more responsive as a parliament to hold government to account in what it's doing to help promote the sector, and also to give industry a voice in the parliament as well, and also the workforce within the industry. Um, so I think on all those fronts, it makes for a very good and worthwhile exercise for a cross-party group. Um, there is also a similar cross-party group on shipbuilding and ship repair um, in the House of Commons uh, and the House of Parliament in Westminster, um, which we hope to also have a degree of collaboration with um, in developing um, responses to such as the UK government's um, national shipbuilding strategy, which is due to publish a new version in the coming weeks. So also a very timely exercise to set the CPG up at this moment. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, I'm now going to just invite Edward Mountain to come in uh, just to make a comment with regard to your CPG, but I do have a, a couple of questions for you um, after that. Edward, can I just... Thank you, convener. I'm, I'm not going to be on any of the glamorous cross-party groups on things like beer, but I have agreed uh, to be part of this committee because I think it's really important. So having agreed to be part of it, it's not appropriate I ask questions or or anything in relation to this, but I just wanted that noted. Thank you, Kavir. Thank you for clarifying that, um, Edward, and it is on the record. Um, Paul, the, the organisations that have expressed interest, in particular, obviously, Maritime UK, are going to act as the secretariat. Um, but although, I suppose, relatively short in number compared to some CPGs, actually covers a substantial part of the shipbuilding industry here in Scotland. Um, Will there be room for, uh, if I can describe them, maybe smaller players? I'm, I'm looking, I know that you, you, you've got Strathclyde University Department of Naval Architecture, um, and I am aware of other um, technical courses that relate to shipbuilding. Presumably, the CPG is open 
um, to those sorts of groups to approach as well. Absolutely. Um, that's just a starter for 10, hopefully. And as the CPG becomes more well known, um, we're more than happy to invite a, a broader cross section of participation from across the, the, the industry. Um, Maritime UK very kindly, proactively agreed to, to steward the, the, the CPG by providing a secretariat. We've also had interest from BE Systems, which is the biggest shipbuilding company in Scotland. Um, also, the Institute of Engineers and, and Shipbuilders in Scotland, which is a long standing professional um, body for, for the industry. The Confederation of Shipbuilding Engineering Unions. We've also got CMAL, which is a public sector procurement agent for CalMac Ferries, uh, as well as academia. So that was just a cross section of um, interest. We've also had interest sub subsequently from uh, Malin Marine, which is another SME operating uh, in the shipbuilding engineering sector in Glasgow. Um, so it is going at a fair pace, uh, and we're hoping to continue to, to sort of elicit support as we go forward. Excellent. And I suppose my slightly cheeky question, was it a slight surprise that there wasn't a pre-existing CPG for shipbuilding in Scotland? <laughs> well, I suppose the issue is one of capacity. Um, when you take out government ministers and uh, members able to participate in CPGs, the number of people available to, to participate in a given CPG is quite restricted. So um, I guess I have a personal interest in the industry, having previously worked in the sector. So I, I felt there was a gap in the market uh, for <laughs> for uh, setting it up and I'm very grateful to colleagues for, for their support and, and hoping that his first year will be a successful one. Excellent, thank you. I know Eleanor has a question. Eleanor? Thank you very much, convener, and um, welcome this morning to yourself, Paul. Um, it's just a quick question and with regards to um, cross I suppose cross CPG working that could perhaps happen. Um, I'm a member of the Recreational Boating and Marine Tourism CPG, as is Stuart McMillan, who I notice is on the, the membership list for this one. So it's just to, to know if there's going to be plans to make sure that where we can dovetail that work in together between CPGs that we do that. Is that something that you anticipate? I, I, absolutely. Um, thanks very much for that comment. I think that's exactly what we really want to achieve. Um, even just in conversations we've had um, in the initial sort of informal meetings, uh, just to consider setting it up. Um, the amount of opportunity that suddenly presented itself, where companies are saying we really want to bring everyone's attention to the level of interest in building boats, building ships in Scotland. There's so much work out there to be done, and if we tie all these ideas together, we could actually seriously increase the number of jobs and employment around um, the sector. So, you know, recreational um, boats, for example, there could be more manufacturing around that, more skills, more apprenticeships. Um, so that's just one example, fish farming, you know, through to lifeboats, through to offshore um, support vessels, to the bigger sort of um, ferries and cruise ships, etc. You know, so it's a huge area of, of opportunity for us, and I think tying together adjacent um, CPGs to make sure we're sort of making the most of that uh, is absolutely crucial. So thanks very much, and excited about that that opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Eleanor. Do any of the committee members have a question they would like to pose? I'll take the, the general the general silence silence is not. Um, can I thank you for attending, Paul? The committee will consider whether to approve the application for recognition at agenda item three. And the clerks will inform you of the commission's decision thereafter. But can I thank you for attending today? Thanks very much, Convener. The next group that we will hear from is a proposed CPG on poverty. And I'd like to welcome Beatrice Wishart, MSP, who is the deputy convener of the proposed group. Um, to this meeting. Good morning. Could I invite you to make an opening statement setting out the um, the ideas behind the CPG? Thank you, Convener. Good morning and good morning to committee members. Um, yes, the cross-party group on poverty aims to act as a forum for exploring the drivers uh, of and the solutions to poverty in Scotland. It would act as a, uh, to connect MSPs with organisations working to tackle poverty as well as with people living on low incomes across Scotland in order to better inform anti-poverty policy making and contribute to the ending of poverty in Scotland, uh, something that I think everybody in this parliament wants to see. The group intends to explore the drivers of poverty and different experiences of poverty across Scotland, covering issues like stigma, rurality, race and disability, as well as looking at the particular risk of poverty experienced by certain groups, such as lone parents. We are keen to explore how we can gain greater consensus on the need to tackle poverty, both across political parties and across Scottish society at large. With over a million people in Scotland living in the grip of poverty, we believe that this group is hugely necessary 
and one that can make a real contribution towards going uh, towards ongoing efforts to prevent and reduce poverty poverty in Scotland's communities. Already, we've been hugely encouraged to see the enormous interest in the group's work, with both the inaugural meeting and a subsequent informal meeting of the group attracting a large and diverse group of uh, organisations and individuals. individuals. Uh, and importantly, many of these uh, organisations are smaller community-based organisations who often struggle to have their voices heard in policy-making processes or in the Parliament. And we hope this group would act as a forum for them to help shape and influence discussions around poverty in Scotland. Subject to the committee's decision, the convener will be Neil Gray and deputy conveners Pam Duncan Glancy, Jeremy Balfour and myself. The secretariat for the group to be provided by the Pover by Poverty Alliance, Scotland's uh, national anti-poverty network. And we believe this is the first ever cross-party group on poverty and consider that it's in the public interest for MSPs of all parties, alongside expert stakeholders, to work together to tackle poverty in Scotland. Thank you very much, Beatrice. Um, and just before we move on, I know that Bob Doris would like to put something on the record. Bob? Um, th thank you, Convener. Um, I should just note that in the papers that uh, I, if this group was to get the approval of this committee, I would be a member of the cross party group, and indeed I intended that that I attended the first meeting that the Beatrice Bishop spoke about. So um, clearly, I may have been a bit prejudicial as to whether this group should go forward or not, in a positive sense. And I would very much hope, and I'm sure it will do, uh, Ms. Bishop, uh, draw on the lived experience of those who uh, have had to endure poverty, uh, not just currently, but over a number of years. Thank you, Bob, and that's uh, your interest is is noted on the record. Um, can I ask Beatrice? I mean, you have a very substantial list of organisations, and I think you rightly pointed out that um, people working in this field um, are often small, geographically um, located in one areas, but doing extremely good work. Um, I assume that as the if the proposed CPG goes ahead. Um, the CPG will be open to other third parties joining and, and, and bringing their lived experience um, and hopefully solutions um, to this appalling problem of poverty across Scotland. Absolutely, it's. Uh, I mean, we, you know, just getting going, and if there are more people who want to be involved, the the, the door is open. Uh, all all it all helps everybody's lived experience and groups that are working. Uh, as you say, uh, smaller groups in, in communities, uh, I mean, because it's an issue that affects everybody across Scotland. So uh, that would be absolutely essential. Excellent. Thank you for that. Do any of the other committee members have any questions they would like to raise? No, that's fine. Um, can I thank you for attending this morning, Beatrice? The committee will consider whether to approve the application for recognition at agenda item three. And the clerks will inform you of the committee's decision thereafter. But can I thank you for coming on this morning? Thank you, convener. Thank you. The final group that we will consider today is the proposed CPG on sustainable transport. And I would like to invite Graham Simpson, MSP, who is the proposed convener of the proposed group to this meeting. Good morning, Graham. Would you like to make an opening statement about the intentions of the CPG, please? Yeah, um, thanks very much, convener. It's a, it's a pleasure to join you this morning. Uh, and before I get into my pitch for the CPG, can I just say how much I enjoyed the uh, committee's debate uh, recently in the chamber? I, I thought it was excellent, uh, and I appreciated uh, your kind comments afterwards, uh, convener. Um, during that debate, uh, I mentioned, I'm being really cheeky here, but it's to inform the committee. Uh, I mentioned that I've got a, a proposed uh, member's bill coming up. The consultation for that will go live next Thursday, uh, and I will send that to the committee. So, having got that out of the way, um, if I can talk about the uh, CPG um, on sustainable transport. The background to this uh, convener is that in the last session, we had uh, CPGs, there was, so there was one on uh, cycling, walking, and buses, and there was a separate CPG on rail. Um, 
Now, those of us who are members of one or both uh, got together and decided that actually it would make sense to merge these two uh, and call it uh, Cross-Party Group on Sustainable Transport. Um, so those that were involved in those It would appear that Mr. Simpson's video feed has frozen. And I don't know whether we're going to be able to return to it. Give him a moment. I think from looking at attendance that we may well have lost Mr. Simpson and he has dropped offline, unfortunately. Ah, the travails of IT. This is just to give more evidence to our committee for later discussions, I think. Um, but for the record, um, can I thank Mr. Simpson for his comments about our debate um, and the discussions that we had afterwards. And in eager anticipation, I look forward to <laughs> his bill winging its way um, to us. Um, I am not getting indi any indication that, there were, that Mr. Simpson is going to be able to um, rejoin us. So, what I intend to do is to move on to agenda item three, which is the formal part of approving the three cross party groups that we have heard from this morning that is, on beer and pubs, maritime and shipbuilding, and poverty. Um, do any of the members of the committee have? comments or uh, views to express before I formally put the proposal to the committee. No? All right. Can I formally propose then that the three CPGs are recorded recognition, that is the cross-party group on beer and pubs, maritime and shipbuilding, and poverty. Are we in agreement? Excellent. Thank you. I would now like to formally suspend the meeting to allow for a changeover of witnesses. Can I welcome viewers and audience back? Um, we are now at agenda item four to deal with some subordinate legislation. We're going to hear evidence on the Scottish Local Government Elections Amendment Order 2022. And joining us today are George Adam, Minister for Parliamentary Business, and his officials, Lachlan Hall and Ian Hockenhull. Um, can I welcome you all to the committee this morning? And could I invite you, Minister, to make a short opening statement? Davina, and good morning. And can I take this opportunity to wish you all a happy new year? This is the first time I've seen you, and hope you had a restful and enjoyable festive period. But can I thank you, convener, and the committee for giving me this opportunity to discuss these proposed changes to the procedures for running local government elections in Scotland. During the productive session on the 28th of October last year, uh, we had a discussion about a number of other SSIs. Committee members raised a matter of monitoring of election expenses and the guidance available to candidates on this issue. Following that session, I reflected on these points with my officials, held further discussions with the Electoral Commission, and as a result, I am now proposing the provisions in this order, setting out a statutory role for the Commission in producing and policing guidance in this area. I would like to make it clear that the Commission already produces guidance on candidates' expenditure, but this is carried out on a non-statutory informal basis. The Commission has welcomed the proposal to make its role statutory. Uh, this move would also bring arrangements in line with those from the Scottish Parliament elections. Overall, I consider these changes will provide greater clarity and oversight of electoral spending. The order uh, will bring forward the order will bring forward the date when poll cards can be issued to electors. This change has been made specifically at the request of the convener of the Electoral Management Board for Scotland. I would not normally have made this change at this relatively late stage, but the convener has requested it and the change is to the benefit of the voter, so I have decided to bring forward this amendment. These changes are, of course, relatively minor, albeit important, uh, and will clearly not have a significant effect on candidates, electrical, electoral administrators, or others in relation to preparing the elections in May. I therefore 
do not consider the gold principle as relevant in this case, and the Electoral Commission has indicated its agreement on that assessment. I hope that you will agree with these provisions of positive changes, which will benefit both voters, candidates, and administrators, and that you will therefore give your support to this order. Thank you, and once again, I am happily open to any questions you may have. Thank you, Minister, for that. And just before we come to the questions, I'm just going to invite um, Eleanor to come in on something she would like to put on the record. Thank you very much, um, Convener. And it's just during the consideration of this item. Um, to um, refer to my register of interest that I am still a sitting councillor at East Ayrshire Council. Thank you. I'm very grateful for that, Eleanor, and my apologies for not doing it um, before inviting the minister to present his opening statement. Um, minister, if I can um, just hone in on a couple of points which it may be helpful to get some clarification on. Um, what do you think that the implications are going to be for the transparency of election expenses with regard to local government elections as a result of these proposed changes? I, I thank you for that, Convener. I don't believe there will be a, any impacts. Candidates' expenses, returns, and declarations are already available for public inspection, uh, inspe inspection for two years. Following the receipt by the returning officer, and copies can be requested on payment of a fee. The new requirement for returning officers, convener, uh, to send copies of candidates' expenses, returns, and declarations to the Electoral Commission, if requested, allows for the Commission to request copies without payment of a fee. Thank you for that. And, and I suppose, just as well, we should formally put on the record that the intention, um, if this is, if this amendment order is agreed to. That it will affect any polling on or after the 5th of May, which would include the forthcoming local elections, and hence your evidence with regard to the Gould principle of it not affecting it. Um, I've got a question with regard to the memorandum, uh, sorry, the policy note that you delivered with regard to paragraph 10. Um, and I'm fully aware that the, the, the answer to this may not rest with you, Minister, but hopefully will rest with. Um, those that are also here today, which is with regard to the duties of the Commission with respect to the compliance. And I understand when the Act came in that the um, extensions that are being sought in this were specifically excluded from the Commissioner's monitoring and compliance role. And I was just wondering um, whether you or indeed those around you are aware of why that was specifically excluded at the time. What I'll do is I'll probably ask Ian to give you a more detailed answer than myself, and give, uh, we can take it from there. That's very helpful, Ian. Good morning. Um, essentially, the the Prepare Act is a UK piece of legislation, and at the time, Scottish uh, Parliament elections were within the control of the UK government. So, the change in that Prepare provision was made in relation to UK elections and also Scottish Parliament elections, but. Scottish local government elections were devolved, so it would have required Scottish legislation to make the same change. And I'm not sure why no one has made this change until now. It's probably a reflection of the point the Minister has made that, in practice, the Commission is fulfilling this role already. And this is formalising a role that they've been performing since that date. So there probably isn't a great pressing need for it, but the Commission were very keen for the role to be made formal uh, in this instrument. So, so we've responded to that. That's, ironically, that's very, that's very helpful, Ian. Ironically, convener, ironically, convener, it's been a conversation that I've had with officials as well when we're asking the questions, uh, because uh, uh, my question was, if why hasn't it been done before now? And it, it just appears to be yet another one of these quirks of the local government elections, which we've already experienced in the previous session as well. Yes. That's yeah. That's that's very. That was sort of my understanding in the, in reading through the, the legislative consent at the time. But it is nice to be able, after some twenty two years, to get this uh, on a more formal statutory setting. If it's a, if it's agreed, um, that 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 that's very helpful. My, my other question, really, I suppose, relates to um, a sort of statement that there are no cost implications in respect of this. Does that extend as far as the monitoring role that will become a statutory requirement for the Electoral Commission as well? Is that being uh -huh. considered? Yes, uh, the 
the electoral in discussions we've had with the electoral commission, they've indicated that since they already have carried out this role on an informal basis, they do not anticipate any additional expenditure will be incurred. So uh, the the hope will be that as they go down this more formal route, it will be business as usual for them. It just means that. The whole process is just to enable this to be part of the formal process instead of them actually being like almost the electoral commission being like an afterthought, which is not a place where we want to be. So it's just mm. to make really formalise the whole process. And it also helps in that movement away from, in essence, the government having to ask them on ask the um, electoral commission to do this to put it on a statutory footing, for the electoral commission to be able to pursue it. Indeed, and it also gives us the opportunity, for, as far as transparency and everything else, it, it just looks and feels a lot better. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for that. I am aware that um, Edward has some, quite well, a number of committee members have some questions about the polling card situation. Yeah. So, Edward, if I could pass over to you. Uh, thank you, convener, and uh, George. I welcome the fact that you're bringing the, the, these issues back to the committee, and, and it's as a result of listening. Uh, to the committee's earlier evidence session. I, I would remind you gently that I raise the issue of the level of expenses and hope that you will bring that forward at another committee meeting in the future, just turning though the issue of poll cards. Is this another quirk um, that just seems to have slipped uh, past the thing? Because it seems to make logical sense to bring it into line uh, with Scottish parliamentary elections. Hey, probably, uh... Mr. Mount, you're probably correct. It is probably another one of these quirks. I think when we look at the local government elections, it's effectively they are exactly what they say in the tin local government elections. They are run by the local authorities in each and separate of all 32 local authority areas. So they are, by their essence, a local uh, run uh, kind of election. Many of these changes, and this one in particular as well, is another one where we've taken another look at it. And we've came back to the conclusion of saying there are a better way of working, and this does was a better way. And incidentally, I'm, I'm always uh, happy to listen to you, Mr. Mountain, uh, and any of the ideas you have. We may not agree all the time, but I think over the years you and I have managed to uh, develop a reasonably good friendship and be able to work with one another. Well, at the risk of damaging your political career, I think this is a good idea to bring polling <laughs> cards uh, forward. So. Uh, there's a level of agreement. Let's hope we can re reach one on election expenses for councillors. Thank you, convener. Very grateful. Do any other members have any questions relating to the polling cards before I invite Eleanor, um, who has a point that she would like clarified? No? Eleanor, can I pass over to you, please? Thank you, convener, and good morning, Minister. Um, could I ask you, Minister, given the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, are there any plans in place to bring forward the postal voter deadline uh, um, at the local government elections, as was the case with the Scottish Parliament elections in 2021, bearing in mind this may affect voter ability to register for an absent vote? So the earlier um, that we have this decided, the better. Yes, uh, thank you, Ms Whittam, for that question. and, uh, and in answer to it, probably the exceptional circumstances of the world that we currently live in, and uh, obviously the, what happened in the 2021 election, were driven by the need to ensure adequate time for administrators to process a potential surge of postal votes due to the pandemic. Given the increase of postal voters last May, we do not anticipate a similar increase this year, as many who want to vote by post will now already have that in place. I know myself, I've been voting by post since 2007, and uh, mainly uh, that was a quirk of my being so busy in my own working life. But I won an election that year, and not being uh, someone that's superstitious, I decided to just remain a uh, uh, kind of postal voter. I've been winning elections ever since. So we don't anticipate there to be the same issue. It'll still be the people that are already down as postal voters. But bringing forward the deadline would reduce the amount of time for people to apply for a postal vote. So in the whole, and the way I can answer your question is, we don't anticipate, just to summarise, it to be any more than last year. But we already have a solid group of individuals who have requested that that's the way they wish to vote. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eleanor. If I just pursue that point, Minister, because I am aware 
that there was a significant rise in respect of postal votes in the Holyrood election, but I'm also aware that there are a number of people um, who are unclear themselves as to whether or not they registered just for one election or for ongoing postal votes. And indeed, um, I've spoken to members of, of the public um, who have been slightly caught out with that over a by-election that I'm aware of. So has any analysis been done um, in relation to the figures of people who signed up for just the Holyrood election rather than um, ongoing postal votes for up to the years that are required? As you'll be aware, Kavina, the, the, uh, the actual registration to vote will be as a rolling uh, kind of uh, poll and we keep check, updating our information all the time. And from my own perspective and everyone else's perspective, it will say you're a postal voter and you do, you wish to retain that. And it's up to each individual to ensure that that happens. Uh, so on the whole, I don't believe, but that's just me saying from hearsay, I'll ask Ian to maybe give you some uh, solid uh, facts on that. Thank you. Ian? We have asked electoral registration officers if they could provide us with some updated figures uh, on the levels of postal voting. Uh, the, the drive uh, last year got postal voting registration up to around about 23% of the population. And as you said, some people choose to only register a postal vote for a one-off occurrence. Um, so that would anticipate we'd anticipate a bit of drop off because of that. Hopefully, most people have gone for a, a continuing one, but we we don't know the exact split. So we've asked for that data to see what the current level is. Um, I think going back to the, the initial question that that's that in substantial increase that was achieved last year. Um, the concern was that um, electoral registration officers wouldn't have enough time to process all of those additional applications, which is why we modified the deadline. Speaking to the electoral registration officers, we're not as anticipating as big a surge this year because of the work that was done last year, not even though there's the point that not all of those requests were for continuing postal vote. So uh, that's why we're not I suggesting we change the deadline uh, because of that. I'm grateful. Bob, you wanted to come in. Convener, thank you, Convener. Just a very brief question, inspired by your own like, like, line of questioning. Um, uh, of course, the minister said that uh, you know, ele election offices in each local authority area will, will remind individuals, first of all, <laughs> uh, in relation to making sure their voter registration is still valid at the address that they stay at, but also to remind them they have a postal vote and do they wish to retain that. I am just wondering um, whether there is a uniform approach to that across Scotland. Uh, I know there is an electoral management board for Scotland uh, for each election, but I am just wondering whether there are 32 ways that happens in Scotland per local authority or whether there is a, a more standardised approach. I expect to the answer at your fingertips, Minister, but it is just in case the committee wants in the future to look at the management of postal votes uh, across Scotland. I am not saying that we will, but I just thought the, the, the convener's um, question was an interesting one. Actually, it is a very good question, Mr Doris. Uh, I would be interested in the answer myself. Uh, I would assume uh, that it is a standardised approach uh, through all 32 authorities, but I will maybe ask Ian to maybe if he can give us some further information on that. At the, um, several ERO's cover more than one local authority, so yeah. uh, it's, it, I'm trying to remember. I'm desperately trying to remember exactly how many electoral registration officers there are. I think it is around 12 or 16, but I think his colleague may be about to tell me. <clears throat> but apologies, I can't remember exactly the number. Um, but yeah, I think they, they effectively do follow very similar approaches. Um, they have a variety of systems. Uh, there's at least two systems, probably three systems that are used, but I think essentially they follow the same processes guided by the Electoral Management Board. Thank you. I'm grateful. Thank you for that, Bob. And um, one sort of final question, I suppose, more to, to make sure it's on the, um, on the record. Minister, obviously this was a, a, a shortened period because of the urgency in respect of um, this piece of legislation. And with regard to the um, consultations that took place, there's a relatively small number um, of groups that were consulted. Um, and in the policy document, you say that um, it was supportive. Was there any disagreement um, in that consultation with regard to the early issuing of polling cards? 
Well, just uh, so that I can equally get it on the record, can I say the proposed uh, changes were shared with the Electoral Commission, the Elect Electoral Management Board for Scotland, Association of Electoral Administrators, uh, Electoral Registration Committee of the Scottish Assessors Association, the so Society of Local Authority Lawyers and Administrators in Scotland, the Society of Local Authority Chief Executives and Senior Managers, COSLA itself, political parties represented in the Scottish Parliament, and community groups representing protected characteristics. So, on the whole, it's also probably worth stressing that the change was specifically requested by the convener of the Electoral Management Board itself as well. So, on the whole, I do not believe there was uh, this was something that was actually wanted, uh, and it was a way forward. The Electoral Management Board actually asked us to do it, uh, Kate approached us and asked us to do it, and when we looked at it. Like the discussion we're having at the moment, we we actually looked and said this makes sense, you know, to actually do this. So we decided to on there on there. Can I say so? We decided to progress with this. Would this be the normal way? I would like to go about business. Probably not, you know. But again, I do not believe it makes any difference in the election uh, and for candidates and administrators. And also, it makes sense. You know, but I'll maybe bring Ian in to see if there was anyone in the consultation that maybe came up with anything that might have been ne construed as negative. That would be helpful, Ian. No, no, I don't think so. We, uh, I mean, essentially, we think these changes only really affect the Electoral Commission uh, and the Electoral Management Board, both of which actively requested the changes. So, uh, so we don't think the impact on anyone else should be notable. A, a colleague has highlighted to me that it's fifteen electoral registration officers. By the way, sorry, I was inflating more numbers. Thank you for putting that on the record, and um, thank you for that. Thank you, Minister. Do any other members of the committee have any questions? No response. So I'm thankful for that. Can I thank you, Minister, and your officials as ever um, for your evidence today? And we'll now move to agenda item five, for which the Minister will remain present. Um, agenda item five. I would now like to invite the Minister to move and speak to motion S6M 02576 that the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee recommends that the Scottish Local Government Elections Amendment Order 2022 be approved. Minister. Moved formally, convener. Very grateful. Would any committee member like to speak to the motion? Minister, would you like to make any closing remarks? Quite happy at this point uh, not to, convener. I'm grateful. The question is that motion S six M zero two five seven six be agreed. Are we all agreed? And I believe we have agreement for that. Um, the motion is agreed to. Can I confirm that the members are content for me to sign off the committee's report to the Parliament on this instrument? Agreement for that. And can I thank you, Minister, and for to your officials for attending this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Givina. I will now close the public part of this meeting and move into private.